Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. I am Vishal Dahiya and you are watching our show discussion today. Now the new administration in the United States of America has taken charge. Joe Biden has uh, taken oath as the 46th president of the United States of America along with uh, Kamala Harris as his deputy and vice president. Today we are going to talk about uh, not only hopes, expectations and challenges here but also the road ahead in terms of uh, what was promised by uh, these two during the election campaign, the situation in which uh, the United States of America finds itself right now, not only domestically, but also on the global stage, uh, and how this new administration is expected to tackle all those challenges. Uh, and for a detailed discussion, we're joined by two distinguished experts with us. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Professor Harshvi Pant, uh, the head of the Strategic uh, Studies Program at ORF, and we're also joined by former Ambassador Anil Trigunayat. Welcome both of you to Rajya Sabha Television. Let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Trigunayat. Uh, as all of us have seen, you know, during uh, the campaign as well as in the run-up to the inauguration ceremony, there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, friction uh, in terms of uh, the domestic politics which is there in the United States of America. But if you look at the campaign of President Joe Biden, then it was all about bringing in healing touch uh, or, 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 you know, taking back America to its uh, position, both domestically and at a global stage. So how difficult or easy for him and his team it might be, according to you, to navigate through these next four years? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Vishal. In fact, uh, America is going through a terrible crisis uh, at the moment. It is a crisis which is also of an identity, in my view, because U.S. is known to be the greatest democracy in the world. And the very fact that the democracy has been uh, decimated to a great deal by a sitting president until yesterday, I believe that that would be the biggest deficit. Secondly, that USA has never really been since I think the civil war so badly divided as it is today. We know that President Trump uh, had got at least uh, 74 million votes. So he thought he had won the vote and the election was stolen from it, him. And that was what he continued to do until uh, January 6th when he even uh, provoked the crowds to go into the uh, citadel of democracy, the capital. Uh -huh. And uh, that's for everyone to see those sad scenes. So that is one of the biggest challenges for him is uh, how to heal. He's being called as a healer. He is an old politician. He used he was elected as the youngest uh, senator in 1972, and now he's the oldest president the United States ever had. So his job is going to be really very, very difficult in my view, both in the international domain, because President Trump was a disruptor, both in the domestic scene, uh, political scene, as well as internationally. So the kind of uh, crevice that he had created or the standards he created, it would be extremely difficult to bridge those gaps and to jump over them. Okay. However, the biggest challenge for uh, Biden, I, my view is today, is his domestic one. That is the COVID, the failure in dealing with the COVID, how it is, he is going to do something within 100 days so that the America comes back from the brink of disaster. How the economy then will roll back how the employment uh, benefits will flow to the people and the economy uh, gets on the, gets back where it is supposed to before he can even think of uh, getting into the real international domain and now that those are the challenges and apart from filling i mean being a healer uh, these are going to be the real challenges for him in my view in the early days uh, of course it is a very good team uh, his policies are generally predictable uh, what he has talked about is uh, working together with partners with friends the relationship will not necessarily be transactional. Uh, it'll be based on experience and they, of course, certain challenges they face and they'll have to confront them immediately. But the two or three good things that he has said that he will be immediately joining the climate change and he will be working uh, in the international organizations like WHO, uh, WTO or the United Nations and other treaties. So that is something that, uh, that behoves well. Okay. Secondly, he'll have other challenges in the international domain. Uh, and that is his uh, biggest challenge would be, of course, how to counter China and invest Asia, how to get back to the JCPOA in Iran. 
Okay. Okay, definitely those are going to be uh, the biggest challenges, uh, you know, globally. But we'll, we'll come to the global part a bit later. Let's uh, first, you know, uh, bring in uh, Professor Pant on the domestic part here. Professor Pant, as uh, uh, Ambassador Trigunath was also pointing out, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, a tough task for uh, Biden, uh, President Biden and his team uh, to go ahead and tackle all those challenges domestically, uh, specifically starting with, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, yes, I think domestic uh, uh, challenges uh, for Mr. Biden uh, are really, really staggering uh, from COVID-19 to the economy, economic deceleration and to the fundamental fault lines uh, getting uh, accentuated, uh, political, social, cultural. I think those challenges are so huge, uh, in, in my opinion, that it ha they have the potential of sucking out all the energy from Mr. Biden's global agenda. And therefore, and unless he uh, focuses on domestic challenges, unless he makes it clear uh, that uh, he uh, can bring uh, the country back from the brink, uh, I think it would be very difficult for him to rally the country around his global agenda. So therefore, for him, it's it's not only uh, you know imperative as a politician, but also as a statesman that want you know should he want to leave a mark on uh, global uh, history, uh, he will have to rally the country together. And this is a country where. Uh, 75, uh, you know, 74 million people voted for Mr. Trump, uh -huh. where they and a majority of their of his supporters continue to believe that he uh, has been uh, removed through unfair means, and that's the challenge. You know, it's not simply a question of facts; it's a question of alternative universes in which uh, the two camps seem to be living. The positions are hardening, and Trump may be out, but Trumpism is not going anywhere. So that 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 whole idea of what Trumpism means and how it has seeped into the body politic of America. That challenge for Mr. Mr. Biden is going to be huge. And I think the first thing that he's going to face in that context is what he should be doing with the impeachment process. Remember, that is not complete. The impeachment process has only gone through, gone through the House of Representatives. Now, if the Senate takes it up, which it, which it will, the trial is likely to happen. And the trial can boomerang on Mr. Uh, uh, Biden as well, because his uh, legacy, he, he would like his legacy to be about much more than simply targeting Mr. Trump. Uh -huh. But if impeachment becomes this political, uh, you know, uh, the center point of his political agenda, then it, it will become very difficult for him to go uh, and do anything else. And that is the real challenge in a divided polity, in a divided government, uh, a government where Senate is still 50-50. Uh, where senators from the Republican Party and those who owe their allegiance to Mr. Trump will continue to wield significant power, will shape his legacy, will shape his politics, and will shape his policy outcomes. Okay, okay, definitely. That is going to be really interesting, as uh, Professor Pant is pointing out, specifically with respect to, you know, the impeachment process, because ultimately, as I was saying earlier, uh, President Biden's entire campaign was based on the healing touch process and all. But let's uh, let's let's shift focus towards the uh, global, uh, you know, uh, scenario there. And, uh, and Mr. Trigunath, you were earlier referring to certain aspects, and specifically, if you're looking at policies, then with respect to climate change, the environment policies, uh, and obviously trade policies as well uh, and, and and obviously you know the uh, america's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, who because we are in the middle of the covid-19 pandemic so on these two three fronts it'll be really important to see as to what kind of change does president biden brings in in the early days of his presidency because this is when the change is required if at all in uh, policies from united states of america uh, this is true i mean precisely these are the things that president trump withdrew from I mean, he, he dumped the climate change treaty, the Paris Agreement. Uh, he uh, pulled out of the WHO to a great extent, tried to decimate the WTO, uh, and has treated the uh, United Nations only as an instrument of its foreign policy. So therefore, the multilateralism, multilateral institutions really uh, took a back seat and rather a badgering from him. But what I feel is now, as uh, President Biden from day one has been saying, that uh, he will be uh, so rejoining the climate change treaty, uh, which is a very good sign because U.S. is also one of the biggest polluters. And without the United States, the whole purpose of going along with Paris Agreement or something like that is hypothetical to a great extent. Therefore, I'm glad that he will be doing that. Likewise, they have also indicated that they will be um, joining the WHO and will try to strengthen the WTO. But on the other hand, what we are seeing is that he has already um, appointed uh, John Kerry uh, as the in the, the cabinet uh, position, very big position on that for the new uh, for environment uh, related matters. So that is something that is very good. 
I would also expect uh, um, him to work more closely with the European partners. Uh, that will be extremely important because there one has seen a trust deficit uh -huh. uh, that has been growing on. A relationship that has happened extremely transactional uh, with most countries in the world. And so uh, on the multilateral front, I would see that uh, he, he is a professional. He's a pro on the politic, uh, foreign policy and the politics. And he has got a superb team. And so I would uh, assume that all these people will be working, of course, to U.S. interests. But trying to bring the U.S. back into the once they have settled, settled their domestic issues, that is something uh, that should be the priority and is a priority, I guess, for the uh, Biden administration. Okay, okay, indeed, uh, Professor Pant, your views there on on these two aspects specifically. We're looking at the you know the climate change policy as well as uh, uh, the, the you know the the, the prospect of uh, United States of America rejoining WHO. So so this is going to be really important. And as uh, Mr. Tribunath was pointing out, you know the way United States of America uh, you know, plays a role in in United Nations that's also really significant. Uh, yes, because I think for uh, for America it has always been. Um, a source of influence and, and strength, you know, multilateralism, from which uh, Mr. Trump uh, was taking a, you know, from from which Mr. Trump was withdrawing uh, one by one, uh, it has uh, you know that has led to a big vacuum in the global multilateral order, and unfortunately, that vacuum has been filled by countries like China and Russia that actually do not believe in that multilateral order. So we have seen how, for example, WHO was being used in the initial phases of the crisis of last year. Uh, so clearly, there is a challenge for uh, for America to get back into the multilateral fold, to lead from the front, because that's where America can uh, has been be at its best when it when it can lead in those institutions. Uh, and in partnership with, with like minded countries, I think uh, it creates a big coalition. So whether it is climate change on which I think there is a lot of domestic consensus from within the Democratic Party mm -hmm. uh, establishment in the US. Uh, and therefore, uh, he comes with a big mandate on 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 uh, on. Uh, climate change and WHO uh, and United Nations largely uh, will also be areas uh, where a lot of the agencies from which Mr. Trump had withdrawn, uh, we will see uh, America coming back. But I think what, what is interesting here is that Mr. Biden has made uh, some very interesting statements. He has said, yes, I want to join uh, WTO and the appellate bodies from which uh, uh, Mr. Trump withdrew. Uh, and uh, also I want to join uh, UN agencies, but I also would like to see greater accountability. Now, that is interesting because, you know, in, in some ways you also see the shadow of Mr. Trump here because Mr. Trump's complaint about these organizations was also about that they are not accountable, that their American interests are not preserved. And therefore, for Mr. Biden to accede to that, that he needs to make sure that American taxpayers' money is being spent in ways where America itself is being seen as getting some benefits, some tangible benefits. I think mm -hmm. that is going to be a big part of what he does with these with the, with the, when, he, when he gets back to this. Okay. And also, I think very uh, briefly on climate uh, aspect, while, you know, certainly for Mr. Biden, this is going to be a very important issue. Uh, we have, uh, as Ambassador Trignath was pointing out, uh, there's John Kerry leading it from the front, and there's a lot of support in the Democratic side of the equation. We still see, you know, the kind of sweeping reforms that he want uh, on the domestic front, on the environmental front in America, they might be slightly difficult to accomplish given the 50-50 balance in the Senate and given the resistance that he would face from the Republican senators, especially of the Trumpian mold, where again you will see the influence of Mr. Trump. Okay. And I think that is the challenge that he will face in terms of pushing forth his, you know, his very massive, uh, very ambitious agenda that he has laid out. Whether he'll be able to pull it off remains to be seen. Okay, definitely. It's not going to be an easy task, uh, you know, uh, tackling all those challenges. But, uh, uh, Professor uh, Pant, you also mentioned Russia and China, and that brings me back to uh, Mr. Trigunath here. And Mr. Trigunath, uh, let, let's also talk about the big players at the global stage and how, you know, President Biden's uh, uh, you know, administration is expected to deal with the, these big players. Uh, uh, U.S.'s policy, as far as China is concerned, as, far as Russia is concerned, obviously there is a, a related impact on, on India as well when we talk about these big players. So how do you expect this moving forward? Well, let's look at it like this way. <clears throat> the President Trump's policy towards China uh, was, again, the maximum pressure tactics, uh, the um, sanctions, tariff regime, and vis-a-vis -vis Russia, I would say, what he tried to do was, he was very close to Putin. 
and he wanted to really uh, improve the relations with Russia. It did not happen. And that was the hope because that would have taken care of a lot of hot spots in the world. But that did not happen. But at the same time, they continued to maintain the, the, the same uh, affection for one another. But the deep state didn't allow that to work. Uh, and during this period of Trump, ironically, while they continued to deliberate on major issues, global issues and everything worked together, the maximum number of sanctions on you uh, against Russia were imposed during this period. Now, we know that also Putin was one of the last leaders, big leaders, to congratulate Biden. That was another thing. So while in case of China, and you, if you were to go by various statements that have been made by Biden and his team, as well as uh, the hearing of Anthony Blinken, uh, Tony Blinken the, yesterday uh, in the Senate hearing confirmation, the China was is being treated as a major challenge. It is also being seen not as a threat, but as a competitor. Uh -huh. So therefore, I believe that there is going to be a, a little bit of a uh, change in nuanced policy towards China. They consider it a threat, and uh, that is across the board, and that will probably be a bipartisan kind of a thing. Uh, both sides will consider China as a major threat, but a threat with which you have to work. Okay. So I feel that this is going to be more of a policy where there may be less uh, unilateral sanctions, more discussion, and probably the kind of policy that we follow towards China or have followed, like competition with cooperation. So, because they need China at the climate change, they need China as the international domain, they need China for the international trade. And for many years to come, China will still remain a major player, global player, and might continue to increase. So, in different theaters, it is important that the two major powers work. Okay. As far as Russia is concerned, I see that they have to work together on arms reduction. The START treaty might be discussed. But at the same time, on the bilateral level, you might see a lot of problems. They called, uh, Biden called, uh, I think Putin, a klepto, kleptocrat or something like that. And uh, so even the Russians don't have much of, if you go by Lavrov's statement yesterday, they are not expecting too much. But they are only expecting that um, uh, it will not go more than this. So the Russians are today expanding their influence in different other theaters. They are okay. more closer to China today. They, are, they have greater footprint in the Med Middle East. Uh, they have much more closer relationship with the uh, yeah, with the Europeans, uh, despite uh, whatever statements are coming, all the three major European powers have closer relations uh, with Russia. So they will continue to work with the United States in the international domain at the same time, but they will not be on good terms. And I do not think, of course, there is never a last word in diplomacy, uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, under Biden there will be a very cozy relationship with Russia. Okay. But as far as China is concerned, it will become a little more transactional. Okay, okay, okay. That, that, that's something which uh, we'll have to wait and watch on those two aspects. But Professor Pant, not only on, uh, you know, uh, China and Russia, but also the related and, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact as far as uh, concerned on, on, on several other uh, hotspots, as uh, Ambassador uh, Trigunath was referring to, you know, such as uh, the uh, Afghan theatre, the, the Iraq, uh, you know, uh, theatre there, something happening, uh, North Korea as well. So these are really, really important and correlated aspects and, and uh, do definitely, you know, match with the, uh, the policies of both vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and Russia. And let's also not forget uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, yes, I think uh, what Mr. Trump has done is, uh, uh, you know, is perhaps uh, not uh, often appreciated uh, that he has also radically altered some of the ground realities in various theaters. So whether, for example, you look at Middle East, Middle East today is radically altered. I mean, if Mr. Biden's thinking that he can simply go and revive 2015 JCPOA, that's not going to happen. Uh, we have a very interesting statement recently by, uh, by Henry Kissinger who said that it would be foolish of, for Mr. Biden to revive JCPOA in the present circumstances because much water has flow, flown down uh, the Potomac, uh, if you will, uh, since 2015. Uh, you have had uh, Iranians that have upped the ante on the nuclear enrichment. Uh, the Abraham Accords have changed the complexion of the region, uh, you know, where you have Arab Gulf states lining up with, the, with Israel. And that, you know, in that context, it would be ironical for uh, an administration that says that they want to work with allies, sidelining their Middle Eastern allies and going ahead with the uh, with Iranian deal. So it would be very interesting to see what he does with JCPOA. Uh, and there the realities are much more complex than, than is often being made out. Similarly, when you look at uh, the theater uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, of course, uh, in Afghanistan now we have the lowest number of troops there, 2,500, uh, around 2,500 American troops are there. Uh, but clearly, 
uh, the you know violence has grown and the uh, and the peace process is not going anywhere so for mr biden to take a call on what he, he would like to do uh, under the present circumstances would be slightly more uh, difficult and different than say his predecessor okay on the indo pacific uh, there has been a radical uh, shift i uh, think ambassador trigunai talked about china and uh, we have seen for example china's um, aggressive uh, postures over the last year itself have given indo pacific a completely new complexion and mr ba uh, mr trump uh, for all his other faults was actually able to his administration was able to devote enough attention to indo pacific to carve out uh, an indo pacific policy which i think is much more in sync with the ground realities we have recently seen declassified documents on indo indo pacific where the uh, where trump administration uh, lays lays down Uh, their arguments as to why they want to build partnership with america uh, why with india and how they want to build uh, partners like uh, japan australia south korea okay. so on on indo pacific we have seen a massive shift with a rise in uh, in the threat from perception from china and that's going to uh, be uh, one of the most important theaters for mr trump uh, for mr biden uh, going forward given the challenge that that is emerging from china and from the regional realities so okay. i would say that you know whether you are looking at middle east whether you are looking at indo pacific whether you are looking at a south asian context away from the indo pacific uh, that the challenges uh, have uh, changed enormously from the last time mr biden was vice president and under mr trump uh, the, the policy trajectory has been has taken a direction where mr biden would have to respond in real time to some of the ground realities not uh, hark back to his time under obama so we will clearly see uh, some amount of uh, significant continuity from trump and some discontinuity from his old days in obama okay okay definitely some continuity and something coming in from the previous presidency as well last but not the least uh, mr tirunayat let's 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 look at the most important aspect uh, which you know which concerns us that is uh, from india's perspective what is in it for india uh, specifically with respect to uh, you know the the strategic partnership which india has with the united states of america at at various levels you know it's not only about defense it's it's uh, uh, it's about trade as well and uh, various other related aspects well as far as uh, india's relationship is concerned you have to look at the 20 year trajectory last two decades it has really been institutionalized and under president trump again whatever his uh, dispensation may have been but this is some relationship that he has really taken forward to a very different level uh, as far as defense and security and uh, there are issues in trade matters and that they have that have been under uh, other administrations as well secondly there is a bipartisan support for relationship with india thirdly i believe that india has become far more crucial for united states today if it wishes to somehow confront china a growing china or tame it in that sense i would not put what confrontation way or cold war 2.0 that uh -huh. president trump indulged in but i believe that from all these perspectives from the strategic perspective from the market perspective today we are uh, we we have in last few years bought over 20 billion dollar worth of the arms ammunition the us industry is and the government is driven by their arms industry from connecticut to uh, california and so it is extremely important that they have to look after their interests of course there will be nuances of course they will talk about um, human rights or some other issues uh, on one way because it's a country of lobbies and the pressure groups so whichever way some congressman or some senators will say something something might come up we need to deal with we know how to deal with it but overall trajectory of the relationship is moving forward and in the indo pacific in the beginning people were saying that there is uh, probably he has changed name asia pacific is taken uh, maybe because of uh, his age or mm -hmm. uh, he has um, not mentioned indo pacific but it was very clearly that few days later they appointed a special uh, envoy uh, in kat kempo for that who's a, who's a known uh, asia czar and okay. uh, so they they remain invested in this because that's where the whole pivot has moved so india is going to be very crucial in that Uh, that's what i think so i don't okay. see any major change in the relationship there would be definitely certain uh, differences that would need to be ironed out and i think then whenever the two leaders meet whether the alliance of democracies meet or something like that uh, or g7 uh, we would come to see how it uh, moves forward okay okay definitely let's uh, also take the quick concluding comments from uh, professor pant uh, from your views uh, uh, professor pant in terms of uh, you know uh, the india us relationship uh, during uh, the next 4 years of president biden's presidency how do you see it moving ahead 
Uh, well, I think uh, it's uh, very likely that they would continue to uh, evolve in a positive direction. And uh, the fundamentals of the relationship uh, are so strong today that uh, it doesn't matter uh, the personalities and, and, and political complexion of administrations uh, have ceased to become determining factors uh, in the trajectory. So I hope uh, that the, you know, the, the positives of the Trump administration can continue forward. And I also uh, think that uh, the, uh, the larger structural realities that both India and America confront today in the global order uh, are important enough reasons for the two countries to recognize the importance of working with each other, which they have done in the past. We have seen from George W. Bush to Obama to Trump, a seamless trajectory evolving. And I, and I, and I hope and I have no doubt that under, under Mr. Biden as well, uh, despite some irritants here and there, we would largely continue to evolve in a positive direction. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Panth, as well as Ambassador Trigunayat, for sharing your views and time with us uh, and our viewers here on Rajya Sabha Television. Though this is uh, all about uh, the challenges, expectations, uh, as well as uh, hopes uh, and opportunities as far as uh, President Biden's uh, presidency for the next four years is concerned. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, several aspects to it, both at the domestic level as well as the global level, as our experts were pointing out. We'll keep a close watch on that and keep on bringing you all the salient uh, features and aspects uh, every week or as and when it happens. Keep watching Rajya Sabha Television.